Jennifer was sick. She tried to hide it, but the farther we drove, the more clear it became that she was falling apart. Little cracks kept appearing in her skin. They were thin, almost scratches, and under them, something caught the light. The fingers on her right hand were fusing together, and the lines on her throat had widened and turned a reddish purple. More than a few times a week, I saw Jennifer sit down, looking either short of breath or dizzy. I wasn't faring much better. The dark veins had spread throughout my body hard enough that I could feel them when I pressed down on my arm or leg. They were like thick wires threading over my muscle and bone. Rough gray patches were also popping up all over my body. And my limbs were so stiff in the morning, Jennifer sometimes had to pull me out of bed. We'd started sharing the RV's single bedroom after the night we ran into the smoker and the girl with the mirror eyes. So all things considered, it wasn't an entirely bad trip. This is not how I pictured my life going when all this started, but at least now Jennifer and I were hopefully close to some answers. Would you like to stop and see the world's third largest ball of yarn? Jennifer asked. She was riding shotgun, feet up on the dash and the window down as usual. We were somewhere in the Midwest, more than halfway to California, to Noah. Fields stretched out around us, flat and green and endless. The sky looked like it could spit out a tornado at any second, but there was no rain. I was driving, thumping along on the steering wheel to the song on the radio. At that moment, monsters seemed so far away, and Jennifer with her sunglasses and quick grins so very close. I opened my mouth to reply when I felt my stomach curl in on itself like an alarmed armadillo. It got to stop. I mumbled swerving to a halt on the shoulder. Thankfully we were the only vehicle in sight on the two-lane highway. I barely made it into the bathroom before a geyser of neon blue fluid came bursting out of my mouth. Are you okay? Jennifer asked, knocking on the door. Yeah, I'm fine, I lied. But maybe we saved the yarn for the return trip. We drove on for most of the afternoon. Jennifer and I didn't talk about the weird things we saw along the way, but I could sense things were getting worse for her. I know they were for me. Some nights I would look out at the sky and see unfamiliar stars in impossible configurations. Once I'd woken up to see something like the northern lights outside. Only the ribbons of color were all shades of red. Something massive swam through the lights, a black shape the size of an aircraft carrier covered in dangling tentacles. One of them brushed the top of the RV, and the vehicle shuddered. I pressed myself into the bed holding my breath. Jennifer stirred next to me but didn't wake up. Most of our encounters with the creatures were like that. Bumps and close passings oddities observed at a distance. The majority of entities ignored us. Maybe they didn't notice us at all. A few came near, or at least followed our path, usually with way too many fucking eyes. I always sensed curiosity from those run-ins, but I only ever felt in danger once. The day after we missed the yarn, Jennifer and I were having a picnic lunch at a rest stop and discussing our plan of attack for when we finally found Noah. If you hold him, I can hit him until he tells us how to reverse whatever the fuck is going on with us, Jennifer said. I nibbled at a sandwich that I could no longer taste. I just... I don't know. I feel like we should have a more nuanced approach. You want me to hold him while you hit him? We don't even know if Noah is a he. We don't know anything about them. They might not even be human. Jennifer cut into an apple. The picnic area was surrounded by more fields, a moat of green bordered on one side by the highway and the other by a thick forest. Standing just outside of the tree line was a tall figure with a long, thin neck. It was hard to tell at that distance, at least 200 yards, but it looked like the creature was at least 12 feet tall. The thing was standing, still facing us. Its head drooped down, turning the top of its body into a question mark. Maybe it couldn't support the weight of its own skull. Something about the creature reminded me of the time I'd walked into my garage and heard a hissing sound. This was only a few months after I'd originally lost my sight. The world had gone dark, and every noise stood out. I wasn't sure what kind of animal made that hissing, but I backed out of my garage and slammed the door. There was danger in the sound, the sense of violence coiling. I got the same vibe when I looked at that tall thing on the edge of the field. Get in the RV, I whispered to Jennifer. She turned to where I was looking and froze when she noticed the creature. Jennifer even took off her sunglasses to get a better lock with empty eye sockets. Floppyhead, the clever name I mentally assigned to the monster, began to stumble towards us through the tall grass. RV! I shouted, jumping in. Jennifer was right on my heels, diving in on the passenger side. 
For a panicked second, I couldn't find the keys. Floppy was moving faster now, sprinting towards us from across the field, head bouncing like a ball on a string. He was clumsy but quick, way too quick for a creature that gangly. My brain suddenly decided to work, and I pulled down the sun visor. The keys fell into my lap. Floppy had covered almost half the distance between the trees and the RV before I finally turned the ignition. We peeled out of the rest area's parking lot so fast I worried we might roll over. But then we were on the highway, gaining speed, and I felt every single muscle in my body unclench. Floppy burst out behind us onto the road. Fuck this shit, I said, slamming on the gas. The creature looked ridiculous when it ran, all windmilling arms and wobbly neck, but goddamn it was fast. We didn't start to put it firmly into our rearview mirror until the Winnebago was wheezing along at 50 miles an hour. We drove in silence for a while. I think we should limit our stops. Yeah. We made it to the state line that night. We were searching for an exit to another rest stop or parking lot when Jennifer bolted upright in her seat. Look! She said, pointing at a bend in the hill ahead. Do you see it? I turned where she was gesturing. I did see it. A tree taller than any building I'd ever seen towered over the horizon. The setting sun lit the shape from below and cast a shadow across the forest. Blue lights floated around the tree trunks moving back and forth in wide, sweeping circles. It was breathtaking and beautiful, and seemed so intentional, like we were being signaled. Head that way, Jennifer whispered. I wanted to. I really wanted to. Something about the dancing lights and the scale of the tree pulled at me. I felt drawn toward them. A honking horn snapped me out of the lock. We drifted across the lanes and cut off a car. I put us back on course and stepped on the accelerator. Maybe we can check it out on the way back. Like the yarn, I said. But Lucifer... No, we can't. Something isn't right. Oh, are you sure? Yes, I am. Okay. Jennifer stared out the window at the tree until the sun was fully down. Darkness and distance hid the shape, but the blue lights were still visible for the better part of an hour. Drifting. Calling. We crossed into California just before midnight and decided to keep driving until we reached the coast. That's where Jennifer expected to find Noah, she was tracking their online activity, sitting at the RV's tiny kitchen table with my laptop. Is this really going to take us right to Noah? I called back. Like, at their front door? Probably not. The IP should give us a basic idea, but we might have to stake out the neighborhood for any signs. Could be at least a few days. I saw Jennifer through the rearview mirror scratching at her neck. The strange scars on her throat had started to bleed. She saw me looking, sunglasses lingering on the mirror for a moment. She then picked up the laptop and went to the bedroom. We didn't have to search long for Noah's house. Jennifer directed me down a series of turns until we were in a sparsely populated neighborhood. The area was caught between suburbia and the sticks, houses spread out with large yards populated by rusting cars on cinder blocks and stray cats. There was no doubt which was Noah's property. A thunderstorm whirled over a single home at the end of the street. I inched the RV closer then parked a few houses back. The storm was off somehow. Gray clouds jerked and twisted against an otherwise blue sky. When I looked closely, I saw that the rain wasn't actually falling. It was rising up from the ground like iron shavings lifted by a magnet. An indigo whip of lightning also started from the yard and crawled toward the sky. It moved in slow motion like a snake striking in a flip book. The house was hard to see through the ascending curtain of rain, but it looked old and huge and hungry. Jennifer and I sat in the RV surrounded by a beautiful spring day, watching a pocket storm press down on a house. Do we knock? I asked. Just go say hello, or should we be sneaky and have like a stakeout? Jennifer didn't reply. I turned to see her staring at me, glasses off, empty eyes fixed on mine. Her throat was bleeding again, gentle drips of red staining her collar. She was wheezing slightly with each breath. I'm scared, she said. I reached out and squeezed her hand. Yeah, same. It's such a strange feeling walking through rain that's rising from the ground. Jennifer and I debated driving away and waiting until morning to confront Noah. But after an hour, Jennifer just stood up and walked out of the RV. I followed. We passed through the yard with its little upside-down storm quickly. The water was cold and had the consistency of motor oil. Jennifer hesitated once we reached the porch. This isn't how I pictured things ending when this all started. At least we'd finally found Noah. Do we knock? She asked, leaning against the wall to catch her breath. The lines on her throat were bleeding again. I could kick the door down. 
I lied. My legs were stiff. My muscles felt like jello with cement crawling through my veins. Thunder broke gently above us, ramping up until it was a roar. Another jag of lightning rose in slow motion from the ground towards the clouds. Jennifer reached for the doorknob. It was like walking into a bad acid trip. Nothing in the house was level. The floors were crooked, the walls uneven, but little furniture I could see was mismatched, broken, almost hostile. The entry room was dominated by twin staircases that twisted off into the ceiling. There was a bearskin rug covering the wooden floorboards. Only someone had replaced the bear's head with a dirty blonde wig. I reached down toward the hair and recoiled. It wasn't a wig. We shouldn't be here, I said, turning for the door. It was gone. There was nothing but a blank, grimy wall. Jennifer made a sound that was either a cough or a laugh. I guess we gotta keep going. We pressed on. The halls were narrow and seemed to stretch on far longer than they should. They were full of blind corners, abrupt turns, and occasional dead ends. Some halls were dim, others were so bright I had to squint and shade my eyes with my hand. On and on they rolled. We must have walked for more than an hour. Jennifer was struggling to breathe the entire time, rasping and stopping every few minutes. I wasn't faring much better. Each step felt like I had cinder blocks chained to my feet. One of the hallways was lined with pictures. I tried not to look at them too closely. There were portraits with blurred faces, a landscape under a night sky where a single red star made the paint look like it was bleeding. Halfway down the hall, Jennifer stopped. What is it? I started to ask. Then I saw the picture. It was an oil painting of Jennifer and me, crucified to the side of the RV, limbs nailed into the metal. Our faces were both warped with absolute pleasure. We were laughing so hard that our jaws stretched down to our chests. Let's try to go a little faster. I took a breath to calm myself, made the mistake of glancing at the picture again and I felt my stomach heave. Jennifer waited while I got myself together. Finally we came to a door. The knob was brass and warm to the touch. I noticed a hum coming from the other side, almost a buzzing. What do we do if Noah is in there? I asked. I don't know, Lucifer. I don't know what to do anymore. Jennifer reached for the knob. All we can do is roll with it. 